Hey everybody, P. Dave Turner, executive producer and host of your Break It Down show. We've got a fun episode today. First off, it's the Pete's, Pete Koch and Pete Turner. Old Pedro himself are coming at you with a friend of Pete Koch's. He obviously works in the health, wellness, and fitness space because he's a trainer and, and whatnot, besides actor and model. Handsome, handsome, handsome Pete Koch. But he, uh, he said, hey, let's have Francis O'Neill come on the show. Been a dietitian for over 30 years. And what she brings to the table is knowledge and she's been through all of the different eras of eating uh, she's been a, an elite athlete herself and trying to sort through all of these things and finally getting to a point where she could find a way not only to cook for herself but to pick the best kinds of foods so as we're all going through COVID-19 and putting on our 20 pounds of COVID power I thought it might be helpful to examine this and get us all reset at least trending towards the right way so hopefully you all can appreciate the effort uh, that we're trying to put into keeping us all healthy wealthy and alive. So, uh, Frances, you can go check her out. Uh, obviously, on LinkedIn, you can find her there, and that'll be in the show notes if you don't see it. And then also, you can go to Food RX, where food is medicine. Because here's how we have to look at food food is the thing we put in our body. We heard that food is fuel and everything, but you're investing also in the health and wellness of your organs, of your mental state, of your brain. And, and we got a really good episode coming up with a doctor who talks about brains. And when we start to realize how fragile this system is and how for over 40 years, 30 years, 50 years, whatever it is, if you don't put the right kinds of things into the system, it does start to break down and that erodes our quality of life. And since, and I'm finding this out myself, since we're going to be living longer, I thought I'd already be dead by now. Um, you know, we have to start taking care of ourselves because, goddamn, we're going to live to be 60, 70, 80, 90, maybe even 100 years old. So I thought that was be a, a great conversation. I know you're going to be interested, obviously, in what Pete has to say because it's always brilliant when he contributes all the wealth of knowledge in his head. And Francis, of course, is a fantastic guest. So there's that. Hey, listen, here's how you can support the show. Go to the website, breakitdownshow.com. And nose around a little bit. Find an old episode. Uh, the guest list has, is 700 guests long. So go back through and find something. Email me. Hey, Pete, um, do me a recommendation. So, tell me a show I should listen to from the archives. Okay, great. I'll do that. Have you checked out our album fights? There's so many things on the website. Website's about to get a whole lot better. So that's how you can support us. Obviously, telling a friend is a huge way to do it. And I can't wait for you guys to tell me what you think of what you find. All right. One last thing to say, and that's Save the Brave. Savethebrave.org. That is our partner charity. If you're into helping veterans with PTSD, gosh, we could sure use your help. Your time, your money, your attention, whatever it's going to be. Go to savethebrave.org and let us know what you'd like to do or let us know if you'd just like to help and need some suggestions. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great time. Here comes Francis O'Neill. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mitchell. Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> This is Francis O'Neill, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. It is the Pete's again at Q's on Wilshire. Hey, Pete. Good to see you again. Good to see you. You've brought us a, a fantastic guest. Uh, why don't you tell us who we're talking to? I'm proud to introduce Francis O'Neill. She's a friend of mine from some many, many years ago when uh, I live in Los Angeles, and Francis used to, and um, we, uh, we knew each other from a health club. How fitting, right? And she was the registered dietitian yes. of this um, uh, actually a very beautiful health club in Los Angeles and uh, it comes to f I, I came to learn that we had some things in common and that we were both athletes in college mm -hmm. and Francis mm -hmm. was uh, go ahead tell us a little bit about your college including uh, your graduate school sure so I, uh, I I graduated undergraduate from UC Davis uh, majored in dietetics minored in exercise physiology I'd been an athlete since the age of 10 as a competitive swimmer, and I took that through my high school years into my college years, so I swam NCAA, picked up cross country even, um, did a little bit of that in college. That evolved into marathon running with a PR of 254. Uh, went on to graduate school. After I got into the workforce, I realized I could not affect change in the patients that are the people that I was seeing because of what I perceived as psychological barriers to, to eating. A lot of them I, I perceived as being just very unhappy, depressed, and they could tell me more about nutrition than I could tell them. I felt completely inept, 
and knew that I had to do something. So that led me to um, graduate work at UCLA uh, in social welfare, which essentially is just giving you kind of a uh, you know, education and human behavior and psychology. And so that I then brought that back into the workforce. And it is, has served me incredibly well, uh, especially in my, my current careers uh, as a dialysis dietitian, working in a dialysis unit, as well as, in a, as a, a health educator as well. So I'm at both ends of the spectrum, mm-hmm. and it is uh, quite, quite the education to, to see these two populations, you know. When you talk about helping people, it really resonates with me, and it reminds me of a, a friend of mine that um, I met some years ago, and he was uh, very interested in athletics himself. He went to the University of North Carolina. Mike is his name, and, and he studied exercise science undergraduate. Then he got his master's degree in kinesiology, and then he became actually an assistant strength and conditioning coach and worked with the athletes there at the University of North Carolina. And he realized that his passion would be to help a whole bunch of people. What he ended up doing as a strength coach in college was was helping a very select group of outstanding athletes to improve themselves. And he certainly found reward in that. But he really wanted to help a lot more people. And he saw everywhere that he looked, and we all see today with 71% of the population overweight Overweight. in the United States. He says, how can I help those people? So he switched his focus and started a, a... actually a food delivery company because put healthy food in a box and say, listen, I'm going to deliver this to you. No excuses. Right. And he did well with that. And along along the way, and this is sort of interesting, he wanted to build a, uh, a food bar because he, he's, a, he's a pragmatic man. He's a pragmatic thinker. And there's always people say, I don't have time. He kept on hearing people saying, I don't have time. I don't have time to prepare and do these things. And uh, so he, he developed a, a natural food bar. And that's what he's anyway. Basically, that's what he's his business is now he's very successful but i appreciate your passion for helping people just and as a as a personal trainer myself uh, i realize that i'm highly limited i've spent most of my adult life helping people in in one-on-one training and um i see a a, a move in the phys- in the in the, in the and these things do happen in trends in the physical fitness world and and i see a, a movement towards group exercise orange theory which which uh, started 10 years ago is uh, it was sort of i think that company came around right on the coattails of uh, crossfit so crossfit and for those that don't know but crossfit and, and Orange Theory, there's I think there's almost 2,000 Orange Theory locations around the United States, and about, I think there's about 10,000 CrossFit, and there's other companies coming up on their heels, and they get they help people get physically fit in groups, anywhere from eight to 18 to 28 people in a group. So that is how um, I think we can help people, and I'm I'm inspired by that on, on the fitness side of things, and what you do, and I'm interested to hear more about it, how uh, you're attempting to reach the masses and help them live better lives through better food. And so why don't you pick up that thread and tell us a little bit about what you're doing? Well, I I'm had a terrible diet, even though my, my education is in dietetics and I have a, a very passionate about healthy living. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to eat healthy. And what's a terrible diet? Oh gosh. You know, the seafood diet, <laughs> um, the you know um, uh, one that's highly processed, yeah. where you're just you know you're not cooking, um, and I did not know how to cook. Uh, you're not you're you're relying on somebody else to do that job. You're just relinquishing that responsibility of nourishing yourself to somebody that you don't you don't have any idea what their yeah. motives are, what they know, what they don't know, and um, and I had a terrible sweet tooth mm. that mm. that literally hijacked I uh, that's the term I use it hijacked my brain I really was I I was a prisoner to it um it just consumed my thoughts I think I would have been a far better athlete Mm. if I had a more balanced diet but instead it was I mean I was pretty much consumed with when I was going to get my next sweet Mm. and this lasted probably until my mid-40s I couldn't I mean from a from an adolescent to my mid forties. That's a that's a long stretch of time, and um, and uh, fortunately, I, I married a man who was a very good cook, and he was able to take over that responsibility until I, I we started a family, and then I knew that I couldn't 
continue to let him have him be responsible for that. So I struggled. I, I struggled with it until I stumbled upon a rice cooker. <laughs> <laughs> I was desperate. Hold and, on, we're uh-huh. gonna get there, but I, I need to unpack a few sort of more the the macro issues first, if you may. Sure. We live in interesting times. It was just a few years ago that the, the majority uh, of the population knew nothing more than you know, sort of uh, trying to eat fewer calories. And and it, it was mm. just tw- about a couple of decades ago there was a, okay. a, a great big movement to get people to eat less fat oh my god my goodness we need to eat less fat so that we can be healthier and uh, mm-hmm. the driver of that was uh, the fear of heart disease because it was identified and I put that in quotation marks because it was m- r- truly misidentified by a mm-hmm. scientist who said that it was it was fat that was giving us heart disease it was a guy named Ansel Keys mm-hmm. and um, and and so th- that's when the, the supermarkets were filled with um, fat-free everything you can think of, fat-free cake and right. fat-free, right? right. And, 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 and what was this, the sum t- result of that, of a decade or two of that, was fatter? Americans were fatter than ever yeah. and sicker than ever, yes. more heart disease than ever. Mm-hmm. What a mistake. We figured it out, right? And, and, and uh, we're simplifying a very complex subject, but those fats are good, right? Absolutely. Okay. Excellent. I I fell into that. I, I fell hook, line, and sinker for that. I actually worked for Pritikin. I were if you know Pritikin followed that whole Ansel Keys theory, and uh, I worked for them. And you know, so of course I'm I'm going to follow along and and uh, and do that same same thing along with everybody else. And yes, I think that just fueled that much more my my carb cravings uh, because I was. I was lacking this one nutrient that really does satiate you and keep you full. Um, and I have come to find that there are two, there, there's people that f- are fueled better on carbs and there are people that are fueled better on fats. Yes. And I, and, and I would never have believed that until I finally, because I was struggling, I was so I was held such prisoner by these carbs I knew I had to do something drastic, <coughs> so um, I got the di- I got a diagnosis of prediabetes, when, and in 2015, even though I'm a dietitian, I'm a certified diabetes educator. I was well within normal weight. And you are not overweight. And I'm not overweight. I was a very uh, very uh, aggressive exerciser. Still am. I was diagnosed with prediabetes, huh. and I at that so that was the clarion call for me. That was. You got to do something serious here. You got to shake it up big. And so I was already toying with the idea of going plant based. So I did that. And then I cut out, I went, I cut way, way back on my sugars for about a year um, until I got my A1C down into to normal ranges. And that's when I knew I had to find a substitute that carbs was my go to, and the sweeter the better. But that I couldn't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. So I said, well, what's going to fill me up? What's really going to make me feel that same sense of, ah, that did it, without the carbs? And I knew it was the fats. And we always had nuts around, and I'd eat, you know, eat a few nuts, but it was like, oh, you know, let me count them out here. So I said, screw that. Give me the nuts. Bring it on. And so I just started fueling up on nuts, nuts, nuts. I added dark chocolate to it. Those are my go-tos now. The change has been so dramatic in every aspect of my life, in terms of energy through the roof, in terms of um, no cravings, in terms of being satiated, in terms of in terms of clarity, in terms of <coughs> calmness, uh, being a- at ease. You know, anything. You know, it used to be that little things would rattle me. Nothing rattles me anymore hmm. because I'm balanced and I'm giving my body what it really needs and optimally functions on yeah yeah that's uh incredible uh we just recently in my house we did like a fast metabolism diet and one of the things i could have for a snack was just like almost a cup of cashews 
And, and I was like, that's not going to fill me up. And I, I would struggle to get through that cup. And I'd be like, oh, my God, I'm so full, you know, from a cup of cashews. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whereas back in the olden times, I might grab a bowl of cereal with milk and, you know, and, I, and, and didn't have two bowls of cereal, you know. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's mm-hmm. what I got to have. It's grains. It's good for me. You know, you got to always have grains. Right. Shocking right. to me how different it is. And, of course, now that I'm doing that, my belt, it seems to be malfunctioning. It's getting longer. Mm-hmm. It's stretching. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? Okay. Uh-huh. So fats. Okay. So I th- I'm thinking like, I think most of our audience is thinking right now. Oh, okay. So this, this woman, this <clears throat> educated dietitian is telling me, I need to eat some fats, get some fats in my diet. I'm overweight. Maybe um, I might be have pre-diabetes or something. Mm-hmm. But when the, the first thing that pops into my my brain when you say fats is like, you know, the fat that's on the edges of a steak. Okay. Or uh-huh. maybe someone says, uh, you know, when you're cooking a hamburger, you see the, you know, sort right. of the fat burn off. Is that yeah. how's that fat? There's different kinds of fat. That so, is not good fat. Not good for fat. many many reasons. Of course, you know, most of us know it's a saturated fat. It's an animal fat. All animal fats, except for fish fat, is a saturated fat, which we know contributes to heart disease. It contributes to cancer. It's inflammatory, ma- massively inflammatory, creating insulin resistance and all these inflammatory processes in our body, which is at the core of chronic disease. You know, four in ten Americans have a chronic disease, a- and six in ten have more than one chronic disease. And that's a huge burden on, on our health care system, as well as the individuals that are suffering from it. Um, and at the core of these chronic diseases is inflammation. And so this animal fat that you're referring to is a saturated, it's an inflammatory process, uh, an inflammatory substance. So that is not the kind of fat that we're talking about. I just want to go back. Yeah. Four and ten. Four and ten. And Four then and ten. six and ten have multiple. Multiple. And mm-hmm. then I also know from uh, the ladies at Prelis who were trying to figure out how to print new organs like kidneys and mm-hmm. whatnot. Basically, everybody has some form or level of organ failure. You know, like what we deal with in terms of dialysis, that's at the end of the road. That is. But there's a whole road before that they're talking about. So four out of ten and six and ten, that Mm -hmm. is incredible to to hear you say that. And and the the real frustrating thing about all this is that we spend by far more on health care in this nation than we do in any other industrial nation. We are worried about coronavirus and like everybody's walking around with some kind of organ failure. Right, right. Yeah. And we can't get it right. We can't get it right. And in the dialysis industry, I really see that as a barometer of how well that interface between health care and human care, mm. how well our health care system is taking care of our, our population and how well the population is taking care of themselves. And we're getting an F minus. We're getting an F minus. It's the number one chronic disease that's increasing. You yeah. know, more than heart disease, more than cancer. We're seeing more and more people on end, with end-stage renal disease. Their kidneys have died, and they are, they are on life support. And it's hugely resource-intensive, it, you know, $100,000 a year for one patient just to get the treatment, let alone the medications and things that are hugely expensive. Um, so we, we're, we're looking at a, an extremely dire situation, and... There's a few people out there that are, you know, have, have, are putting out the call to action, but it's a very, very small number of people. So I, I guess what you're saying is you think that this, the solution, you know what the solution is from a dietitian, from a nutritional standpoint, and that would be plant-based eating. How... How do you reconcile that with an increasing number of people that are uh, championing the paleo diet? Mm. Furthermore, there's a, a doctor, Paul Saladino, medical doctor that I, I follow on social media and I've listened to podcasts with, who's a champion of a carnivore diet. And he, and he challenges the value of vegetables and fruit altogether huh. and uh he's got he's got copious you know studies to back that up so he's pretty much he's a guy that eats uh red meat and uh a i guess a small amount of certain uh uh i don't even want to you know you know state it for him but but basically guy lives on he eats meat for breakfast lunch and dinner he's very lean very healthy 
and uh, he feels that, uh, and, he, and he's constantly, you know, measuring his own, um, you know, sort of blood panels to mm -hmm. see where he stands, very healthy, mm -hmm. and he's, he's, he's um, prescribing a carnivore diet to his patients. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I, yeah, so, you know, there are so many options out there, and, and most of them have some value. And, you know, keto or paleo, you can do that in a healthy way. And it's essentially, it's a low-carb diet, low-carb, very high-protein yeah. diet. And for a lot of people, especially with these chronic diseases like diabetes, um, like, uh, like uh, arth you know, rheumatoid arthritis, with, like for women, the um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is a very inflammatory condition, if you do it low-saturated fat... And the, the meat products are sustainably grown, they're, they're organic, where you're, you're not getting all the chemicals, uh, and, they're, and they're lean. It's a lean source. And you're not, you're not doing the carbs, you're just doing the lean proteins and some vegetables. Again, for these people that have these inflammatory insulin resistance type diseases, that definitely has benefit. The big question with all of these different plans is, is it sustainable? Can you sustain it indefinitely? Hmm. Because if it's just a short-term thing, what, what's your backup? What's your backup? Your backup is, I don't know, whatever the next thing is that comes along. And that's when you're going to run into problems. So if it isn't something you can sustain, you know, just craving wise, you know, financially, having to find a source of it, preparing it, then don't even start. Don't even start. Because then you run into that syndrome of, oh, well, uh, you know, I failed again. You know, this, this one failed again. And you just, you just sink lower and lower on that, on that, you know, feeling of, I, I can master this. Uh, and, and, uh, and we have a whole population of people who just cycle in and out of these things, and they're just constantly looking for the next magic bullet. When it, it's just that you've got to find something that, that you can, it can sustain you, that you can sustain. The common thread that I see when I consider all the diets or eating strategies that are out there is minimize, if not eradicate, minimize the amount of simple carbohydrates in your diet. Mm -hmm. No question. That's the one no thing. No question. Mm -hmm. And that, and the, the, um, at the pinnacle of that would be uh, of you know what you we all should be striving to eliminate would be sugar. Mm -hmm. And then it's sort of if you sort of built a pyramid on down from there, um, there are carbs. There's carbs in the form of, you know, these uh, the bro you know maybe broccoli and and cauliflower fit into one category that I I seem I see to. I, I see that sort of bubbles up even within the uh, community of the uh, the the, car, the carnivore diet people. Mm -hmm. They're still in, sort of in line with that, but they've eliminated. Many people have eliminated, or at this point, some of the people I listen to. I'm not doing it myself. I think Joe Rogan, the podcast guy, you know, the comedian, he's in his camp that he's adopted a, a largely meat-only diet. Mm -hmm. So he's hanging on to sort of a handful of things and eliminating the rest. And he's mm -hmm. reporting what I love about Joe. And Joe, in a, in a, you know, a guy with no formal scientific uh, education, but he, within the spirit of being a scientist, he, 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 he injects himself into the experiment by right. eating this way. Uh, under the, under also, also, the he's getting the guidance of a of uh, a medical doctor who eats this way and mm -hmm. prescribes this. I think it's Saladino, but it might not be. There's a f several doctors that do this now. And then he reports on how he feels, and he keeps track of his, his, mm -hmm. his various, uh, these, these, these blood levels and things, so he can report that. And, I, and that's why I find, at the end of the day, all of this is most interesting, and I'm just, I've just kind of got my ear to the ground listening and watching these people. Yeah. Um, myself... I'm I'm kind of like hanging on to the strategy of eating that I've kind of maintained my pretty much my whole life, which was like I'm I'm sort of stuck uh, in a good way, I think. But to what in, 
had an impact on me when I was a teenager reading bodybuilder magazines, and I call it the bodybuilder diet. Mm. And um, mm-hmm. w- w- with the possible exception that I probably eat a little bit more saturated fat, for example, the yolks in my eggs I eat, whereas a true bodybuilder diet would eat, um, would eat typically a uh, typical breakfast is, you know, six, eight egg whites, a cup of white rice, and maybe a side of a little bit of uh, 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 turkey, bacon, and uh, spinach. Mm-hmm. So, and, and keeping them, they call that, quote, clean. Clean would refer to very, very low fat. Uh-huh. Because I've read too much to, to uh, allow me to buy into that completely, especially for men, and especially for things like testosterone support, we need saturated fat for that. And that's why I, I do get some saturated fat in my diet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of where I am. So, But I know that if you asked, you know, went to the mall and just asked, you know, 100 people, what, you know, what's your eating strategy? You would get probably a lot of different answers. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, uh, probably the biggest, I, I suspect the most common re- response might be, I don't really have a strategy. But beyond that, uh, it, it, we're, I think, especially us here in Southern California, where we tend to be on the leading edge of trends, mm-hmm. that um, I think uh, it's, it's, it's just, um, I'm just waiting for all of this evidence-based research yeah. to shake out and see what's going to be best for us. Oh, well, yeah. Y- yeah, you're going to be waiting a long time. Okay. We're gonna, yeah, there are just so many people, so many, uh, uh, you know, experts that have got their own maybe personal bias or, you know, I mean, we're all a product of our environments. So what they grew up knowing, um, it's, it's very hard to change a person's mindset. I mean, it was, it was, you know, I was in my late forties before I realized the light bulb went on. This is just not working for me. And I had to get the diagnosis of prediabetes for, for it to change me. Now I think, you know, maybe the, you know, somebody else coming in, and watching what I ate could have seen it much clearer than I. But, you know, we, we tend to have our blinders on. I, I agree. We absolutely have to have some saturated fat. We have to. It's necessary. So we have to have some. So it's, you know, all about quantity. And this is, this is an issue that hasn't been mentioned yet, but this is something that I'm very passionate about, is the chemicals in our in our food supply mm. and that's why i mentioned you know sustainably s- sustainably sourced and and organic because there's a there's a, a, a process or an, a, a concept called bioaccumulation where the the pesticides the the insecticides the hormones the antibiotics that we we, we put on our our grains that then get fed to the livestock, and then the, the hormones and the antibiotics that are given to them accumulate primarily in our fat tissue. So if you're eating the fat from these animals that are not organically raised, then you're getting quite a bit. Um, they, you know, I read that 1,000 pounds of grain yields 100 pounds of cow, and, and for every one part per million you get from the grains, you get 10 parts per million in the cow and it gets you get a hundred parts from the human gets a hundred parts per million wow. so it's this in, increasing accumulation of chemicals that the higher up on the food chain you go now are we supposed to be eating these chemicals unfortunately they're everywhere we yeah. can't escape them they're in the air they're in the water they're in the soil they're everywhere our, our environment's extremely toxic and these chemicals are hormone disruptors they're they they affect our immune system um, they, and we, we see this population of uh, super obese, the super obese, that you can't explain naturally. You can't say, you can't look at these morbidly, ex- excessively morbidly obese people and think, oh, they're just closet eaters. There's got to be something else. There's oh, mental illness. Yeah, it, it, there's mental illness. Well, think about these chemicals. I mean, well, just, just the explosion of mental illness in the population right? Everybody seems to have some depression, some anxiety, but we see a lot of bipolar, a lot of schizophrenia, drug addiction, substance abuse. I mean, we call that self-medicating for the most part, right? So these chemicals are neurotoxins. You know, they fray the neurons in our brain. They interrupt electric uh, electricity flow. They disrupt our neurotransmitters in our brain, these chemicals. 
So it, it, again, it, it is so vast and so wide um, that it's it, it's it, it it really, in my eye, permeates every aspect of the human condition. Our food supply. Yeah. Yeah. When you look at like a body as a system, and I'm positive Pete and I have had this talk before, but as you eat these things over time, you know, like if you're, a, let's say you're an alcoholic and your liver is starting to fail, more ammonia is getting into your brain. So now your liver is not working at max capacity. What, what, what capacity is that? Is it 40% and all of a sudden like you've got real significant cascading problems across systems, mm-hmm. you know? And so even if you're doing it at a 10% or a 20% level and you don't have alcoholism, but it's too much carbs or, or the fats are bringing in right. extra things right. that you don't need in your body. Over 40 years, and yeah, things like your psyche break because your body is, it's like running around with 10, 10 pounds of pressure in your tires uh-huh. or, you know, you're, you're cutting your gas with water or whatever right. it is in your car. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't expect your car to run well. You'd expect your exactly. car to break. Exactly. And so yeah. mental we- illness or, or organ disease, both, whatever mm-hmm. it is, make, that makes mm-hmm. a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we are, you know, we, we uh, you know, we think we kind of have this concept that our brains are separate from our bodies, you know, and I, and I say we spend too much time up here. We spend way too much time in our brains and not enough time connecting with our body and listening to our Mm. bodies. And I don't know quite, I think, I think the culture we live in, it's a very fast paced, very stress, stress filled world we live in. So we're constantly trying to problem solve or, or anesthetize or medicate ourselves because we're just on overload. Hey, this is Pete A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. Because our, we're just on overload. And so we spend very little time connecting with our body and listening to the little, you know, you know, even the big noises that it's making, let alone the little subtle hints that it's giving us. And so, again, where, where is that coming from? Well, again, partially is our food. I think our brains are being hijacked. That's a term. That's that's an industry term that we hear um, dietitians and people in the nutrition world talking about our brains being hijacked by the highly processed foods. Um, and that, you know, we have a digestive tract that was designed or came into being at the beginning of time, yeah. the beginning of mankind. That's the digestive tract we have now. Yes, it's evolved, but it is still the same digestive tract that primitive man had. And when you think about the diet of primitive man, what did they have easily ac- easy access to? They had easy access to plants berries, you know, roots, things like that. So our, our digestive tract is most well equipped to process those. Eventually, and you know, not too long after, we learned how to, uh, how to capture, kill, uh, you know, game, and we added that to the diet. But still, that was a big, that was a, a, a big task. Uh, it, it took a lot of doing to, to capture and kill uh, animals. And so again, we relied primarily on, on the plants. Now we've, we've come into this, uh, a place in time where our agriculture is highly specialized, highly mechanized. So we're cranking out and subsidized. So we've got certain, uh, food products, certain grains and things that are being produced mass, massive amounts of, and we're having to find ways to put it into the food supply so that, you know, the government uh, is is getting uh, essentially reimbursed for the monies that they're giving to the farmers. We also have got a food industry that takes this food and turns it into supercharged in that it's fat-laden, it's salt-laden, it's carb-laden. Our digestive tracts aren't designed to process that kind of food, it's kind of like putting diesel fuel into a, a car that runs on gasoline. Yeah. It, it's going to lock down that system. It's very dense, very concentrated, and your digestive tract just 
can't process it adequately. So we're causing a slug it, we're, we're slowing down the system, slowing down the system. So it's no wonder we're not performing optimally. We don't feel good for that and, and many other reasons. And we, we also are not well suited for weight loss. Think about it. We, the only time humans naturally lose weight without trying is illness and famine. That's the only time we do it naturally without having to work at it. Flip side of that is, what do we have to do to gain weight? Our bodies are, and because it's survival, when we lose weight, it's a threat. And that primal system goes in, kicks into action, and says, whoa, 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 no, 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 and fights it. But our bodies are very well designed to gain weight because that's what's kept us alive and allowed the species to evolve and survive. So it's incredibly easy for us to gain weight. And here we live in a world where we're surrounded by and, and constantly being marketed this very fat-laden, salt-laden, the foods that cause us to come back for more, that hijack our brain, that keep us in that lizard brain, I call it, the reptilian brain, and, and make us um, constantly say, wow, that was so great. When do I get it again? Go, go out and get some more right away. Um, so we're, we're, we, there's just, we don't, we don't get a, a reprieve from that until some ma drastic thing happens. Right. Um, or, or we're lucky enough to find somebody who really speaks to us and, and makes us start, opens our mind and plants a little seed. And you, in the, you know, it, you know, you, you find yourself fortunate enough to be around people that help nurture that and, and continue, help continue, uh, you know, your, your journey down this new path. Otherwise you just keep getting pulled back depending on, you know. What you who you surround yourself with. The other thing I've noticed is because we live longer, you know, 40 years ago, heck, uh, two out of the three of us may have been dead from alcoholism or smoking or horrible diet. But now that we're living longer, we're starting to recognize, like, these are the things that lead to heart disease. Uh, quit smoking. Uh, stop, ha stop having three martini lunches. And you start to build these better habits. And now you start to outlive that that ability to, to live like that. And you realize, oh, earlier... You know, I've got to change my diet because, yeah, people have always lived 80 years old, but now a lot of us are living to 80 years old right. just because we can live on dialysis. Yes. You know, for a while we can have heart pills and all these things wow. that you would just drop dead before. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so now we're starting to get like a body of work on how this works. And where I want to ask you about this is a lot of this precision medicine, which is a lot more um, proactive instead of, Hey doc, uh, I feel this weird sensation in my chest. Mm -hmm. Now they're like, Hey, this is your epigenetic makeup. You yeah. need to eat more broccoli because you're tuned to that. You are powered by carbohydrates. So let's find the right kind of diet. Mm -hmm. And this is like the cutting. It's it you know, always, we always use the wild West, but this really is like, there are so many possibilities and you can be proactive, we can be reactive, you can mm -hmm. be plant-based, you can eat just meat, all these things. But now we really have a body of research that's really emerging to understand this better. It, and, and, and let's hope that, um, you know, it doesn't become this opportunity to just make money because then it gets perverted. Um, then it becomes something that is marketed in a way that um, just doesn't just doesn't right. serve us serve us well. Yeah. It be, it simply becomes a way for you know a handful of people to make a lot of money. Um, but there is so much uh, potential there. I mean, it it could be. I like to think I'd like to think it's the thing that's really going to turn this turn this situation around. Because you know, I mean, it really is a dire situation. Kind of like you know, climate change. Mm. I, and I really see the two going hand in hand. I really see because what, what we eat definitely affects the planet. Um, and what we eat is that's healthy for our body is also healthy for the planet. So I, I, I see where that really could be the, the, the kind of one thing that could turn this thing around and, and, and make people and not, not just give people, uh, have to sit there and lecture them for hours and hours on end. You give them, this is, this is what your, your test showed. 
okay? You have the, you're lacking these enzymes, you have a lot of these enzymes, and so this is the diet that's going to work best for you. Right. Yeah. So it, it's much more, provides that, that solid evidence that people really need to, to make the change. Some years ago, you informed me that you were going to write a book because you had kind of stumbled across a strategy for preparing food for your family that you felt was somewhat unique and that it was economical and time consuming and and above all healthy and you employed a rice cooker in in a sense in a way that some people might think of how you would use a a crock pot Uh is that correct yeah so go ahead and uh because i found that interesting i have a copy of your book i have not bought a rice cooker yet (laughs) admittedly (laughs) But uh, I don't. Uh, but if I, you know, I'm 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 a still a bit of a Neanderthal when it comes to cooking for myself. But um, but I do love the idea. So please Great. tell us about Great. your yeah. concept of of cooking and let the folks know about how uh, practical it might be to to cook your meals with a rice cooker. All right. And not just rice. And not just rice. Absolutely. And, you know, I do believe, Pete, you did tell me that you actually did have one at one time, and then you think you gave it to, like, the Goodwill. And I thank you for that, because that's where I found my first one. Yeah, I, did <laughs> I, I was I was desperate. I, I truly was desperate. I was like a caged animal. I, I had to do this. I, I was starting, you know, my kids were getting older, and I, I, I lived on, in high school, you know, college, I lived on popcorn. I literally lived on popcorn despite, you know, my, my excess, you know, uh, high energy output with my, with my training and everything. Um, I, I, I just had a terrible diet. I had no cooking skills. I couldn't stand the idea of being in the kitchen. It was like I was a caged animal and I couldn't wait to get out. So I stumbled through a couple recipes, but it was drudgery. Mm. And, um, and people were telling me, I, I heard people talking about these rice cookers and how great they were. Oh, yeah, you just press the button and you go. And I just, I, you know, that just stuck in my brain. And I was at a thrift store one day, and I'm just wandering around, and I see this rice cooker. And, you know, seven bucks. I figure, what have <laughs> I got to lose? I took it home, and I immediately dropped everything I was doing. I plugged the thing in. I poured rice in there. I poured the water in, pressed the button, and you know, went about my business. 20 minutes later, I had perfectly cooked rice. And I thought to myself, oh, thank goodness. One less thing I have to worry about. <laughs> but then the wheels started turning. And I said, wait, this thing's got to do more than cook rice. I was so desperate. And I just, I, I said, I'm going to put everything and anything I can think of in this thing, and, and I'm, and I'm going to see what it can do for me, because this is too easy. Too easy, pour the stuff in there, press the button, and, and disappear. So sure enough, that's exactly what I did. For the next several weeks, I just put every, anything that I wanted to cook on the stove mm-hmm. or in the oven, it went in the rice cooker. And uh, eventually, I came to, the under, to, to realize that there wasn't anything that it couldn't cook to near perfection at the press of a button and in just a few minutes, hmm. as opposed to having to, you know, slave over the stove or over the oven. You got to have a couple things going at the same time. No, it all went into my rice cooker. And to this day, this is what we cook with. I mean, we'll cook some pasta maybe on the stove every now and then, but everything goes in here. Everything goes in here. And it's incredibly uh, well suited for a plant-based diet because it does we- very well cooking grains and things. But no, I've cooked I've cooked popcorn in it. I've cooked eggs. I've baked a cookie in here. I've toasted <laughs> sesame seeds. I've made pudding in this. You name it, I've cooked it in this thing. Um, and uh, so it was a lifesaver. I love cooking now because of this because of this one little device. And Your rice I, cooker. My yeah. rice cooker. The rice cooker. Um, and I have created all sorts of recipes that are healthy. You know, they had to be lo- mo- low to moderate in carb, low in sodium, uh, low in saturated fat, low in fat. Not that those are all necessary, except for definitely the low sodium you'd want to watch. 
but that's just what I knew at the time. Now I've tweaked the recipes. I've, I've created new ones that are more plant-based. I've, I've taken some of my animal-based ones and given you options to how to make a plant-based version if you wanted. Um, but um, I, I cook every, everything goes in at once for me. That's what works for me. But you can also cook things separately. You can cook your meat separate from your carb. Um, you can cook your vegetables in the steam in the steamer basket in the top. Um, it's a no-brainer. And again, coming from a background of having no cooking skills and never having any desire whatsoever to to cook. Other, I mean, I was fine with baking, but not not cooking. And here I am. I I, I love getting into the kitchen. Yeah. And and creating things. Um, because it's just so easy and so quick. And most of the time, I literally put the ingredients in, press the cook button, and I disappear. Is that just dinner, or can you cook oh, no. lunch, lunch, snacks, breakfast? I, Like I said, I'm. if you name something, I pretty much... Give me an example of a breakfast. I, I'm, I'm yeah. dying to hear a rice so, cooker breakfast. So you can cook, you can hard boil eggs in here, you can poach eggs... You can scramble them. So you can do eggs any way you want in a rice cooker. So that's one. Um, you can do oatmeal. You can do steel-cut oats. I do oats and quinoa together. Um, you can do one of my favorite is what I call um, salted caramel um, oats. Uh, salted caramel. So it's, I'm sorry, salted caramel uh, sweet brown rice. Sweet brown rice. Sweet brown rice is a grain. It's a type of rice, brown rice, whole grain. But it's very sweet. And then I just add a little bit of maple syrup. It's pretty high carb, but for somebody who wants a high carb breakfast, it's absolutely delicious. I toast the coconut, yeah. toast the coconut first with a little coconut oil, and then I'll I'll add my sweet brown rice with a little bit of maple uh, syrup and a little bit of vanilla. No kidding. Press the cook button and and I disappear, and I come back however long later, and I've got this absolutely yeah. scrumptious breakfast. Yeah. That's incredible. Do you <laughs> toast the coconut in the sure in the sure movie? toasted sesame seeds? You can yeah. Wow. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean this, you know, this humble little thing um, is an absolute wonder. And you're only cleaning up one item exactly. instead of several. That was the other thing. Okay, mm. my my three core principles when it, when I decided I got to I got to do this. And I, I have to find a way to make it work for me. It was, I can't, can't have more than two pots. It can't have more than five ingredients. <laughs> and I've, I, I've, I've, I like let that that one. One, I've let that one go by the wayside. <laughs> although my initial recipes did involve that. And uh, so it all has to be prepared in uh, no more than two pots, no more than 15 minutes to prepare it. Actually, it was 10 minutes at first. Now I've stretched it to 15. So those are my three core principles. All of my recipes. No and you're a rice cooker here. This thing is about, I don't know, let's say, call it 13 inches tall and maybe eight inches across. So it takes yeah. no space at all. No space. It's as big no as space. a toaster, basically. And, 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 and so the, the, the follow-up to that is if you're going on the road, yeah. if you're staying in a hotel. I mean, my husband just came back from Vegas. This was in his l- luggage. And he cooked every meal. <laughs> Because he's training, he's training for a, a bodybuilding contest, so oh, he has no to eat very, very yeah. specifically. So this comes with us, wow. and I've named them all, by the way. I and this thing absolutely yum, is portable. Yum. You can put yeah. that into a carry-on, yes, stuff yeah. it full of t-shirts, and all yes. of a sudden it like takes up no space. At exactly, all. Yeah. exactly. You do, you do get stopped usually. They, they do. What often. is this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it passes. You get through, and then you, you know, you don't have to eat out. If you don't want to. Well, that's one of the things, like, I'm on the road a lot, and, you know, I'm trying to adhere to these better eating plans, and it's just tough. Like, okay, now i got to go to a store, and i got to buy a bag of nuts, and, wow, how am I going to compromise and get through these times? But if I was able to make my own food, yep. it would be a make, lot easier. Make your own food. It's very lightweight, very lightweight, and, yes, you're just cleaning the one pot, unless you use the steamer basket. You're just... So, Tell us about the cookbook. Yeah, so, so this... Um, you know, I started developing the, writing down the recipes. I started this whole process back in about 2007. And then I got serious enough that I thought, you know, I might have something here. So I started writing down the recipes about 2011. And they were very rudimentary. I really stuck to those three core principles. Um, and, and I wanted it to be for everybody. 
I didn't want, I wasn't plant-based at the time, but I just wanted it to be healthy. So again, low to moderate sodium, low to moderate carb, low in fat, uh, particularly the saturated fat, um, and very high in fiber. Mm. So all of my recipes include at least one, what we call, um, um, non-starchy vegetable, at least one, but now most of them have a, quite more than that. So at least one non-starchy vegetable because we're not getting enough of our veggies. So that, that was how I designed all my recipes. And I, you know, I have beef ones and I have chicken ones, I have seafood ones, and then I have vegetarian ones. Um, and, uh, and I also have all sorts of very helpful information about you know, very trendy topics like soy and organic and gluten, you know, eating, eating plant proteins and so on. So all sorts of good health information as well. I've, I've, it's evolved where now I'm, I'm creating more plant-based mm. and giving the recipes in here that are animal-based the option how you can make it a plant-based. And plant-based, by the way, is not animal product-free. Plant-based is mostly plant with the option of having animal um, when, when you want it, when right. you feel like, you know, I need some, I need some animal. And that's why I, I really like the idea of plant-based because I don't think being vegan is sustainable one. Um, and I don't think it's, it's for the vast majority of people, really a, a good, healthy way to eat, to just have absolutely no animal product forever. Uh, so, um, so that's why I, you know, I really gravitate and, and really appreciate the plant-based concept. You can have that animal product. How do people get this book? Where, where do you want to direct them? Yes. So I have a website. Ah. It's foodrx.co. Foodrx.co. Uh, like you can it. go there and go to the products tab and, and find it right there. And are there? Is there? You have a, do you have a sample recipe or anything posted on the site, or how can people? Um, yes, check it yes, out? there yeah. are there are um, sample recipes there on that website. Oh, good. Yes, yeah. That's it. And, and you know, you wrote this book, and I know you put a, your heart and soul into it, and gave it a lot of consideration. You're not just somebody trying to figure it out as you go along you have a formal education in nutrition and you have lived a life where you've seen a lot of different trends and frankly the some of the some of the pitfalls of uh, eating strategies that have in a sense been debunked you know um yeah. but hey that's part of of growing up you know as a as a strength coach and a personal trainer myself i mean i think back how i used to design a program for a client that i thought would really optimize benefit for them and i look back on it now and i'm like eh, Rye probably, eggs and wheat germ yeah, yeah. probably mm -hmm. wasn't the best strategy mm -hmm. yeah and mm -hmm. and uh you know something? I have no doubt that uh, 10 years from now, we're going to look back and say, uh, boy, I made a, a bunch of mistakes in, in 2022, uh -huh. you know, but hey, that's part of, that's but right. at least we're in the game and at least we're trying yeah. and applying some critical thought to what we're doing. And I know you've done that with this cookbook. I wish people would check it out. Yep. Thank you. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fully behind that, that, yeah, I think about that, all the mistakes I made as a young dietitian. And going forward, I know that I'm going to con I'm going to have to evolve just like everybody else yeah. who who wants to get it right, who wants to get it right. And is there such a thing as getting it right? No, no, because you know the world around us is constantly changing. Um, so we have to do our best to evolve with it in, in as healthy a way as we know how, uh, and and find and hopefully surround ourselves with people that are supportive of that. Yeah. yeah. But you are talking about accomplishable things: ten minute meals in a rice cooker. You know, whether you're plant-based or whatever it is, you're working on eating from a better location and, and getting your mind, your brain back your in brain line. You, back in brain. you put me in front of a buffet and I can't stop putting my hand out. That's not because I want, it's just like all this subconscious, like eating desire. You exactly. Know? Yes. And I'm only yeah. just now realizing that's the thing. Like if I go to a potluck, I have to like put my hands in my pocket mm -hmm. and get away from the table because mm -hmm. I won't stop. It's, it's that, it's that, you know, I, I, I go back to the lizard brain. 
we are so reactionary, our brains are hijacked, whether it's, I, I even say, I even go as far as to say, we are all under the influence mm. of something at all times. And unless we are mindful, that's a buzzword you hear a lot nowadays, unless we're mindful and we keep an open mind, we are just going to fall prey to all those triggers in our environment that are, you know, that are there intentionally and, and unintentionally. Um, so again, that, that awareness, but if our brains are hijacked, we don't have that awareness. Yeah. 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 With some, one other quick thing that I recently stumbled upon that makes this whole idea even easier is something I call combining, mm. which makes the whole process of what am I going to eat that much easier. Yeah. And it's simply, you have a flavor theme. You think, okay, what do I feel like tonight? I feel like Mexican? Do I feel like Italian? Do I feel like Indian? What do I feel like? And so you you decide what you feel like, what flavor theme, and then you've got in your refrigerators, in your cupboards, you've got different condiments, flavoring agents, whether it's salsa, whether it's some curry sauce, whether it's some, um, some pesto sauce. And then it's, okay, easy Italian combo would be whole grain pasta with some white white beans and some pesto sauce. I have some, you know, greens on the side. Yeah. Super easy. Or it could be some some uh, you know, some lean chicken with uh, brown rice and a curry sauce and some cauliflower. So, start with a flavor theme and then build build from there. So you have, you know, the thing you want to have on your grocery list is all these different, you know, hel- hel- healthier different flavor condiments and and then you can just build something from there well the only condiments i have in my refrigerator are ketchup and mustard so <laughs> not much you can do with that not much but you i can might do want to it. step up my condiment game it's, that's what you're that's saying that's what right? i'm saying I got it's it. so fun out there it's so fun because there are so many different all the different seasoning spice companies and all their different blends and we live in such an ethnically diverse part of the world that you have Indeed. just the world at your fingertips here in terms of all the different spices and flavoring agents and so on. So you go to an Indian market, you go to an Asian market, and you just kind of dabble um, and see kind of what calls to you. It's going to cost you two bucks maybe. Yeah. Uh, you know, no big deal. If it doesn't taste good, then uh, you toss it. What's two bucks? Yeah. Thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thanks, Francis. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you.